was really a big event. I mean, at least for Jonathan, uh, with all the work he put, you know, in in uh, in rejuvenating uh, Basque, you know, and putting Basque, you know, in in order with our status, you know, and and be a legal organization where we can do things the right way. But Basque, you know, there is nothing new in Basque. There is nothing new in the way we are going to operate. And this made us think a little bit, you know, what is Basque? Who are we? What are we doing? And so then you look at, at, at the history of Basque, you know, and so we have a list of our presidents and the first president of Basque was Penny Wells. That was 35 years ago. And so this is what I found, you know, on the, on, on the list on the internet. And so I, I asked Penny uh, uh, originally last summer and I finally swayed her and, I, and I'm really glad she accepted to do this, to uh, give us a little retrospective of how did Basque start? What happened uh, in 35 years until now? I mean, now that we have reinitiated you know, a process for another 35 years, uh, let's, uh, uh, let's uh, uh, have Penny tell us a little bit about Basque. Penny, it's all yours. Okay, so let's see. Somebody needs to put me on the screen. Could you join her or whatever? So, Jonathan, you were going to do this for me. He probably left. <laughs> I'm right here. I was <laughs> muted. Sorry. Continue. I was muted. Um, Penny, if you're just going to talk, you don't have to do anything. We can all go into speaker view and, and then if we okay. mute ourselves. I'm just going to talk. Yeah, and people should mute themselves so that they don't suddenly take over the feed. Yeah. Also, no, Jonathan, you could Jonathan said, did I have any pictures? Well, I have thousands of them and there was no way I could. So I'm just going to talk. Okay. If that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Are you being okay. checking with the pictures, Penny? <laughs> Shut up, Jim. <laughs> She got pictures. She got pictures. <laughs> so everyone, be quiet so that Penny can. So, take so I what I'm going to talk about are just the early years of Bass, because um, you may not know, and I hope I don't bore you to tears. So um, sometime back in the early 1980s, there was a skinny blonde 29 year old named Keith Miller. Okay, so there was Keith Miller, the skinny 29 year old who was teaching canoe lessons out of, out of his garage. So several of us uh, took his canoe lessons and kind of got hooked on the concept of paddling. And once we got done with his class, we said, well, Keith, uh, what, what do we do next, you know? Well, he suggested that we check out an organization called Outdoors Unlimited which was at UCSF in the city. At that time, Outdoors Unlimited was an out, outdoor cooperative that the university basically put in place um, as, a, as an outreach tool to the community. Basically, the neighbors were pissed off because the um, university was sucking up all their parking places on the street. So this was supposed to calm the neighbors down. So we went to UCSF and had a whole bunch of really fabulous canoeing adventures. Then we attended a talk at OU by a guy named Clyde Winter. And he had jury rigged together a kayak and paddled the inside passage of Alaska solo. So that was an oh my goodness. So my friend Elsa Castellani and I approached him after he got done talking and asked him to teach us to kayak. Well, back in those days, we were two slender, blonde, tan California girls. Now, what could a farm boy from Wisconsin possibly say but yes? So he did what we asked him and four or five people learned how to kayak from this guy. Our very first kayak trip that we ever did was from Chrissy Field out the gate and back. And then we just said, oh, this is just too terrific. We love it. We're going to do this. So an Outdoors Unlimited sea kayaking group was born 
And eventually we figured we needed a name. And so we thought that Bay Area Sea Kayakers was a good name or Basque. So that's how Basque was originally born. And at that time, early 80s, mid 80s by this time, the sport was growing. In 1986, we had our first meeting and I was away on a business trip. And in my absence, I was elected the first president. <clears throat> and that was the beginning of Basque's first motto. And we have many mottos. That motto was, be there or be president. That was also the year of our first newsletter, which came out every month. Our first surf clinic, which was taught by the Tsunami Rangers and our first t-shirt. We were busy as bees that year. Then at some point, we noticed that the same five people were doing all the work. Now, Steve Leonidakis, who was running OU at that time, suggested a solution. He said that if you took a small group of people and subjected them to an intense learning experience by another small group of people, they would bond and pour their energy back into the group. So we tried it. Steve Leonidakis even put our ads for a beginner sea kayak clinic in the Chronicle. The OU philosophy of learn something and teach it to someone else worked so well that Basque is still doing it 35 years later. When the membership hit 600, we figured that maybe an annual novice clinic, which was an outreach tool, was no longer necessary. So we switched it over to a skills development clinic. And so it is today. So the skills clinic is an enrichment tool. No matter how or what your skill level is, there is always more that you can either learn or teach. So that's, you know, there's that. So there were a lot of firsts that happened during the late 1980s. We had a lot of energy. That was when we first started going to Monterey in January to look at the whales, as Tim was just describing. We're still doing it. We met Audrey Sutherland and asked her to come to a Basque meeting and talk about expedition paddling. She operated on what she called the KISS principle, which was keep it simple, stupid. And um, she had done, she lived in Hawaii. And by the time that she died, when she was, I think, 94, she had logged something like 6,000 miles of solo paddling in the summers in Alaska. So she was kind of a rather remarkable person. And she came and she explained about expedition paddling and why it was cool. Well, we were off and running when it came to expeditions and we never let up and we never looked back. So where, where all have Basque trips gone over the years besides right here at home? Well, Baskers have paddled the entire coast of California as well as the entire Bay, the Delta and the Sacramento River from the upper reaches clear to the gate. We've been to Hawaii. The Nepali coast of Kauai is one of the very favorite places to go in Hawaii to paddle. And I've, I've done it five times at every time. It's just fabulous. Baskers have all, we've paddled the entire Sea of Cortez and all of the islands. I've been there 12 times, but others in Basque have been there many more times than that. And a couple of Baskers actually bought property down there and live there part of the year. Another trip that is a fabulous trip uh, that Baskers did is the um, Stikine River, which starts in British Columbia and winds up at near Wrangell in Alaska. The Stikine River is kind of remarkable because it is supposed to be the last undamed, undamned major watershed in North America. The river is flat water and it goes fast, six to 10 knots, and it's cold. There's glaciers that come down into it. But Baskers have done it. And uh, if that's not on your bucket list, put it on your bucket list now, because it is something that you will never forget. The logistics are pretty simple. You fly in a plane to Wrangell, you take a folding kayak, 
you get on a puddle jumper in Wrangell and you have them fly you up to a place called Telegraph Creek. At Telegraph Creek, you put your boat together and get in the water and then you paddle 180 miles back to Wrangell down the river. It is beautiful. There are things to see there that you wouldn't believe. There are um, petroglyphs that are on rocks that are buried that you can find. There is a hot spring that humans have been going to for millennia, but only in the recent past has been developed so that there is a wooden boardwalk that goes from the river up to where the spring is. And then there's a changing room and a wooden deck around a really large hot tub. And after you've been on the river in cold water for a while, that's pretty darn nice. Um, Another thing that happened to us on the Stikine that was pretty cool was um, we were camped at the foot of the great glacier of the Stikine. And a woman came running down the path from up somewhere on the glacier and asked us if we had a gun. And we kind of went, a gun? No. Why? Well, apparently their dog had a confrontation with a porcupine and the porcupine won and the dog was now completely stabbed full of porcupine quills all over its face. And the only solution they could think of was to put the dog down right now because it was suffering. Well, we had going on this kind of a wilderness adventure, we had a medical kit that would allow us to take each other's appendixes out if necessary. So we grabbed our first aid kit and went with this woman and we found the family lying on the dog. It was a big uh, lab holding it down. And I got out the syringe and the lidocaine and shot its muzzle all full of lidocaine. And then we continued to work on it and pulled out all of the porcupine quills. I have a little vial of those quills still, and so does Joe Toback. And they said, well, we actually own a um, fish processing plant for salmon down the river a ways. So when you finally get there, come and say hello. So we did. And when we got there, they made us stay overnight. They gave us rooms. They gave us hot showers. They fed us. It was very nice. And on we went. And in fact, a couple of years later, another group of people went down the Stikine River and got to that same place and um, mentioned our names, at which point they got the same fine treatment that we did. So, you know, it's a small world. It's a small world. So anyway, put the Stikine River on your bucket list because you'll never forget it. It's fabulous. Um, also, there's... Alaska, you know, you name it, and baskers have paddled there somewhere. This is especially true in Southeast and also in Prince William Sound. So, you know, this, you can talk to anybody that's been to Alaska and they will rave. We all love every place we've ever been up there. Um, another place that you might want to put on your bucket list uh, where baskers have gone on a couple of occasions is Haida Gwaii formerly known as the Queen Charlotte Islands. And uh, that's a really another place that has an island with a hot spring on it. But the thing about Haida Gwaii is that the Haida were never conquered. And they basically live on and kind of own and manage Haida Gwaii. And the thing that is spectacular about it, besides paddling, is that there are a lot of village sites that are so old and they have totem poles, Haida totem poles. And anyway, it's just, you need to go there. Um, a lot of Baskers have been to Vancouver Island because there's a lot of, it's close by and there's a lot of places to go there. Um, some many years ago, somebody, from up north came down and spoke at a Basque meeting about Vancouver Island and said that um, the island was being very severely clear cut 
And if you wanted to see anything up there, you should go immediately. So a bunch of us did. And uh, we went up and our plan was to paddle around the north side of uh, <clears throat> the Brooks Peninsula and then down south. And I know other people have asked, I think uh, Ellen and Tom have done this. Haven't you guys? Yeah, I thought so. Um, so we got there and the weather was so perfect. It was warm. It was bathing suit weather. Um, it was calm. We went slower and slower and slower because when it's calm, you go into every possible nook and cranny. And we did. And then we got out to the end of the Brooks Peninsula. And then black clouds started piling in. And we paddled out to Solander Island to see the puffin rookery and the stellar sea lions. And as we paddled back, the storm started to hit. And we just barely raced into a protected cove and pulled all of our boats up into the trees where we hunkered down for three days while this storm howled over our heads. And when we finally got back to civilization later, people told us that it was the worst summer storm they had ever had. The anemometer on Solander Island, which was about a mile and a half or so from where we were, blew out at 87 miles an hour. So stuff can happen. And um, that, was, that was our experience. And, but other people have gone there and just had wonderful good times. Um, Mendocino is another place that Baskers like to go a lot. We now go there on an annual basis and Baskers have explored every nook, cranny, cave and tunnel along that entire coast. And uh, these days we all migrate up there in September, although we didn't this year because of the pandemic. Um, and we go there to paddle, to camp and to eat. And that's another one of the things that we discovered. Basque is an eating club with a kayaking disorder. But hey, so anyway, back to the 80s. In 1987, that was the year that Ed Gillette paddled his kayak to Hawaii. And he came and he talked to us about it, but it didn't inspire anybody else to do that. That was also the year that five hardy paddlers paddled out to the Farallons and back. There haven't been too many people that have ever done that. In 1988, John Lull bought the first coaster, and that was the beginning of the coaster cult. No one in those days would ever consider selling their coaster, but if they did, they would have gotten more for a used boat than for a new one. Huh? Why? Because no shipping charges, and you got the boat immediately. Now, a couple of baskers, I think Joe Petalino could have been one of them, actually wore holes in their boat from paddling it so much. Um, 1988 was also the year that Bonnie Brill, who was quite famous in bass for getting into trouble all the time, that was the year that she swam at Mavericks on her 40th birthday. So on this woman's 40th birthday, John Lull and I and Bonnie decided to paddle out of Princeton Harbor and go north up the coast and explore and see what was there. So we did, we paddled straight out past Mavericks. That was our plan. And once we got past Mavericks, we were gonna make a right turn. Well, Bonnie decided that she was going to cut the corner and she went between where Mavericks breaks and the reef. And as she did that, we saw the Mavericks wave coming like a mountain. And as it broke, we saw Bonnie come through the crest of the wave and we thought, oh good, she made it, she made it. But her boat slid back down. And the next thing we saw was Bonnie's boat completely airborne, flying through the air without her in it. So we turned around and we paddled back and there was Bonnie Brill swimming in between Mavericks and the reef, closer to the reef. And she was yelling help with a Southern accent. Well, I looked at John and John looked at me and neither one of us without saying a word 
we're not going in there to help her. So we paddled around to the back of the reef, figuring that we were going to pick up body parts in a body bag. And when we got there, there she was, standing, unhurt, with her boat not too far away, and it had broken its rudder, was all. I mean, that was the goddess's gift to somebody on their 40th birthday, right? But no, it didn't end there. We went back paddling some more, and uh, we didn't get very far out when a baby seal swam over to Bonnie's boat and it kind of sort of rested its head in her lap. And that was so cute. I mean, how, how, who else has had a 40th birthday like that for Pete's sake? 1988 was also the year that Susan Starbird, who lives up Santa Rosa way, discovered Estero Americano and what a beautiful place that was to paddle. And then she went politically ballistic over Santa Rosa's plan to dump their um, used sewage water in there and to, ex to increase people's exposure and their awareness she started a paddle called the Cow Patty Pageant. And the Cow Patty Pageant basically was a race that went, not hardly a race, it was a fun, a fun thing, that went from um, uh, Two Rock down to the bay and to the water where the, where the Estero jumped into the ocean and then back again. And that that event has been going on, I think in February, every, every year since then. A number of different baskers have hosted it. And most recently, uh, it's John Dye that has been doing that. So that was always a good one. Now, the 1990s were kind of interesting also. It was in 1990 that the entire Basque Navigation Clinic scored rides on the Coast Guard boat after falling in and swimming at the South Tower of the Bridge. Now, mind you, all of the dozen or so paddlers were and are quite accomplished paddlers. These were not necessarily novices. So the South Tower got a reputation and it is a particularly fun and interesting place to paddle at Max Ebb. So if you haven't done that, and you have some experience going in and out of eddies, you might give that a try. Then in 1992, more excitement. Ken Kelton and Mike Chin met Jaws at Anu Nuevo. So uh, I cannot tell the story of this anywhere near as Ken Kelton used to tell it because he was a master storyteller. But basically what it amounted to is Ken, as you will remember, was a guy that would do just about anything. Mike Chin had never paddled in the ocean at that point, but he was a fairly advanced whitewater uh, kayaker. And as they stood on the beach getting ready to go, Mike Chin told me that he asked Ken if there were sharks out there and Ken said, not to worry. So off they went. They got to Año Nuevo and the great white shark grabbed Ken Kelton's boat, dragged it underwater, shook it around and then spit it out. That was a little shocking. And the boat was taking on water. So they paddled ashore as fast as they could go. At which point the um, ranger at Año Nuevo came charging down the beach yelling that you can't land here. This is a sanctuary and blah, blah. And she took one look at the boat and went, oh my God and brought the truck and drove them both to their cars. So that was a story that ended okay. Um, 92 was also the year that a couple of Baskers went up to Alaska and paddled in the Ididiac. And they, that's a 65 mile race. And they came in first and third. So that was, that was really cool. Now, that was also a year when Bonnie Brill made Basque history again by crashing into a cliff at Big River in Mendocino and breaking her Tsunami X1 completely in half. And that's quite an accomplishment because 
those tsunami boats were high layup fiberglass and Kevlar. They were heavy boats designed for paddling in rock gardens. So to break one completely in half and just having it together, holding it together with the rudder cable was, was kind of exciting. Um, in that year, Ken Mansard also managed to get wedged sideways in a cave at Mendocino and break his coaster. He had to climb out of a hole in the back of the cave into the um, cemetery, dragging his boat behind him. Those are just some of 92's events. Then came 93. And in 93, the Bass Novice Clinic was led by, get this, a doctor and a lawyer, and they didn't kill each other. Um, and that particular novice clinic became famous for dancing the hokey pokey on every beach they landed on and singing songs. Well, in 93, disaster struck. Um, Outdoors Unlimited, who had been hosting us, giving us a place to meet and providing insurance and everything else, um, had a, fat a fatality in one of their climbing events. It had nothing to do with bass or kayaking. But the UC lawyers suddenly noticed Outdoors Unlimited. And Outdoors Unlimited had to withdraw their support for the Bass Novice Clinic because they didn't want anything to do with non-university people. Uh, or, you know, like we were just the community, right? Well, CCK stepped in and filled the insurance gap for us. So they were heroes for us at that point. And that marked the beginning of a dissolving relationship, which had been a very happy and fruitful one between UCSF and Basque. The lawyers were extremely uncomfortable with uh, Outdoors Unlimited's outreach to the community and their involvement with the community. And it only got worse after the family of the climber that died sued, as you can understand. Um, it was also in 93, during the um, early part of the decade, that Ms. Baustern appeared and began advising Baskers on kayak etiquette. Now she was pithy and hysterically funny and nobody knew who she was. But I know, and I'm not telling. Um, now, I should also say that back in the days when we had regular meetings every month, we used to have safety discussions that would last an hour. And, you know, so at some point in time here, this guy keeps coming to Basque meetings with stories of solo adventures up on the coast that were so harebrained that we decided that we were gonna to have to do something. And what we did is we made him safety chair. Now that guy was Mike Higgins. He's been president twice. In 96, he and Jamie Morgan embarrassed Basque into setting up a website. And a couple years after that, Jamie set up Buzz and that changed Basque forever. Then in 99, a guy named Maligiak Padilla visited Basque. He was 17 years old and he was the kayaking champion of Greenland. He stayed at Arno Roloff's place. He built a boat while he was here. Using that boat, he taught us a lot about Greenland kayaking and he taught Mike Higgins how to roll on both sides. And I'll never forget Mike coming out of the water after Maligiak did that and going, I know how to roll. And he just took off and has hardly been seen since. Now, 1999 was also the first gonzo paddle. And three Baskers had to get rescued after they fell out of their boats in the middle of the bay on that paddle. And they were rescued by Sean Penn and they got a ride in his yacht. Okay, so in two, the year 2000, Basque appeared in a Farley comic strip. We were famous at that point. And also in that year, a bridge jumper nearly hit John Lull as John was paddling under the Golden Gate Bridge. So there's another very good reason to have a su suicide barrier on the bridge. 
We don't want people landing on kayaks. Then I have to have a little sip of tea. In the early 2000s, there was a little group of Baskers who were sitting around grumping over pizza and beer about how the shoreline of San Francisco Bay was getting all developed and all of the places that they used to access to put their boats in the water were just disappearing. Something had to be done. Well, Bass was, was a recreational club and was apolitical. So we spun off a group that was called Bay Access. Bay Access Incorporated, they examined the possibilities and of what to do and decided that a regional water trail would be a good solution. So Bay Accessors wrote legislation which passed both houses almost unanimously and the San Francisco Bay Water Trail was born. That water trail is now a project of the Coastal Conservancy, and there are about 50 designated sites, as well as a couple of places where you can camp from your kayak. This all started with Basque, and Basque has really been very instrumental in making that whole process go. So it was 2001 when the Basque membership hit 600. And when that happened, that was the year we changed the novice clinic to the skills clinic. Then in 2002, Basque, organized by Jenning G, went to China. And the Basque group did a first descent of the Li River by kayak. And China has never been the same since. Now, in order to do this trip, what Jenning had to agree to was to have a um, Chinese Coast Guard vessel accompany us and for us to have a Chinese guide. Okay, we went along with all that. That was fine. Well, it turns out that the uh, Coast Guard vessel that was supposed to accompany us was very large and very commodious. And we stayed, we slept on it every night and they fed us and they fed us quite well actually. And the meals on that trip got even better after we taught the cook how to kayak, which we of course only did after lunch. We weren't gonna risk killing the cook before it was meal time. Um, the guide was also somebody that had never been in a kayak before. So we had to teach the guide how to kayak. But then we paddled down the Lee River and it was something to behold. It was definitely fabulous. Well, then the following year, Dave Littlejohn and Gino Thomas did that famous uh, kayak peace sign photo at Horseshoe Cove which Palm Press turned into a Christmas card and will probably live on forever because of that. In 2004, two different Basque trips went to the Black Canyon. Now the Black Canyon is famous for hot springs, hot pools, hot creeks, hot caves, and fantastic scenery. The second group that went down the Black Canyon had to get up at 2 a.m. and flee a flash flood. They survived. Now, later that year, a little group of Baskers got lost in the fog at Drake's, Drake's Estero, and they, had to, they were forced to spend the night out there, shivering and burning cow pies for heat. They barely survived and talked about it for a long time. Then in 2007, Basque's most eligible bachelor, Ken Mansard, was taken out of circulation by Jane Lombardo and the skills clinic organizers, Chris Hauser and Dave Harry, got married. Now, that was the second time that had happened in Basque. So you need to be careful who you volunteer to do things with. Who knows what could happen? Now, Chris and Dave later moved to rural Oregon 
and were visited by 30 or 40 of their closest Basque kayaking friends when the solar eclipse happened a few years later. And what a time that was. And we saw the eclipse from their backyard and it was just fabulous. So basically, we have learned what we know by what's often called the crash and burn uh, method of learning. And a few of those rather exciting or memorable uh, learning experiences happened like, there's Eric Soares. He was the founder of the Tsunami Rangers. He was um, a superb paddler and a rock gardener. And just, you know, he was good. Just, he was beyond good. He was legendary good. Well, he fell out of his boat at Alcatraz and had to get a ride. He was picked up by a ferry boat and carried off by, carried home by the ferry. He complained that if he would have just been in one of the tsunami boats instead of his closed cockpit boat, that wouldn't have happened. Then there, there was Reg Lake. Now, Reg Lake was a class five river god, if you will. He was part of um, a little group of guys that did first descents of major rivers all around the planet. And he took a swim at the South Tower and got a ride on the Coast Guard boat. And what he said he learned from that was that if you let go of your boat, it goes with the wind while you go with the current. So, you know, he, he lucked out on that one. Um, I might just add a little aside as to how I actually wound up meeting him. We used to have sort of on an annual basis what we called uh, Angel Island pig outs. And on the first one, uh, my friend Elsa and I, and so everybody left from Horseshoe Cove and went to Angel Island. And my friend Elsa and I were putting together a clepper. So uh, nobody wanted to wait for us, so they didn't. They left and we were, we were to come later. By the time we got on the water, it was kind of like getting dark and we had never been to Angel Island before. But we had a pretty good idea, we thought, of where it was. And so we headed off towards it. And lo and behold, we found Angel Island. We appro approached Pearls Beach and we could tell that there was surf there. So we knew how you uh, go through surf because we had read about it in a book. What you do was you point the bow of your boat straight at the beach, you pull up the rudder and you paddle like crazy. Well, we did all of that. And what we learned was that cleppers have two speeds. There is slow and stop. So we went slow. And because the rudder was up, we really couldn't control it very much at all. And at that point, our clepper turned itself sideways in the waves and rolled over, dumping us out. And we kind of stood up beside our upside down boat and we knew we'd gotten to the right place because there were a bunch of people on the beach and they were all laughing. Well, later on, and I don't think it was on that particular Angel Island pig out, it could have been a different one. Um, after dark, Reg Lake shows up. And at that point in time, Reg Lake had a little business at uh, Pier 66 in San Francisco. And he couldn't leave to come to Angel Island until after uh, he closed up shop. So he closed up shop and got in his riverboat and paddled over to Angel Island and came up and when, in, and in the dark, by the way. And uh, so he walked into camp and, and I, I didn't know him, but I, you know, when he said what he'd done, I kind of bawled him out for being so stupid as to do something like paddling by himself in the dark across the bay. <laughs> and, um, Fortunately, he was gracious about it, and we became quite good friends later, and ultimately wound up going to uh, Chile uh, to watch the solar eclipse down there, which was pretty damn fabulous, too, because we saw it from, uh, God, up in the Andes, in a place where we could see smoking volcanoes, 
and a lake full of flamingos down below us. And when the eclipse came, you could see the shadow coming up this valley, and you could almost hear people gasping as it arrived. Anyway, it was cool. And Reg Lake was cool, too. Now, the day that Bonnie Burrell broke, broke her boat at Big River, several other people also swam. I don't remember who they were because her boat breaking was the most absolutely amazing. Um, there was another swim by a fellow named Jud, Judd Ingram, uh, who was paddling in what was called the uh, Kelp Cutter Classic across Monterey Bay. Well, he was in fog and he fell out of his boat and spent five hours in the water before the Coast Guard found him. That was in 1989, and that was the first Coast Guard rescue that I'm aware of, of kayaks. There have been a few others since, of course. Um, that was probably also the end of the Kelp Cutter Classic. Then out at Point Bonita, there is a beach that is named after Gino, Gino Thomas, our Gino. And um, he kind of crashed in there. And John Summers shared the glory by racing in to help and crashing his boat too. Now, subsequently, late years later, John Summers also got to have a ride on the Coast Guard boat on the night of one of the holiday parties. So he sort of came dragging into the kitchen at the PYC looking pretty damn. And his story was that he had gone to do some surfing at Yellow Bluff and he'd fallen out of his boat. What on earth he went to Yellow Bluff by himself for, I don't know, but he did. Um, and he got swept out the gate. And somebody on the bluff saw an upside down kayak and called the Coast Guard. And the Coast Guard went out and got him and brought him back. So lucky for him, in spite of all of that, he still didn't miss dinner that night. Then more recently, Don Barch crashed his boat into the rocks at Point Bonita. And that lured Ken Mansart onto the rocks for what turned out to be perhaps the swimming adventure of his life. Um, now this is how Don Barch got his name, Don't Follow Don. So that's kind of his moniker now. It took all the rest of the baskers that were present to pull Ken out of the rocks and get him to the beach. Um, we, he was suffering from hypothermia, so we had to create a, a cushion for him to lay on with our PFDs and wrap him up in our space blanket. And that's when we discovered that those space blankets that you carry with you in your emergency, they're worthless, throw them out. Um, but in any case, somebody that was up on the bluffs saw what was going on and alerted the ranger at Point Bonita. And the ranger looked and saw what was happening and the ranger called the Coast Guard. And so the Coast Guard came and Ken got a ride back to Horseshoe Cove on the, on the Coast Guard boat. And I went with him on that trip because he's just wearing a wetsuit and you know, what if something happened? Somebody ought to know who he was. So um, on board the Coast Guard boat, they put him down below deck and wrapped him up and, and put an oxygen mask on his face. And uh, Ken, as you know, is a firefighter and also a paramedic. And I was looking down the hatchway and I saw Ken on the gurney and I saw Ken's arm reach out and go over and turn on the oxygen tank. So even though they put an oxygen mask on, they sort of got excited and forgot to turn on the oxygen. But in any case, we got back to um, Horseshoe Cove and they had radioed ahead and there was a paramedic vehicle there. And they, and by that time, Ken was feeling quite a little bit better. And they checked him all out and, he, and pronounced him okay. And we walked back to the PYC and at that time, the PYC was open. We could just walk in. And in the downstairs was a bathroom with a shower. So we put Ken in the shower. And Ken had a nice, long, hot shower. So that he recovered pretty good. And we went out to the parking lot. And by then, 
all the rest of the baskers were back and everybody was getting dressed and into their regular clothes and and uh and suddenly the ranger from point bonita shows up in his truck and he comes over to where ken is sitting if i remember right and if ken is here he can correct me if i'm wrong I seem to remember that Ken was wrapped in a towel and sitting on the um, back of his truck. And the ranger sat down and said he had a few questions that he wanted to ask Ken. And he took out his notebook. And before he started writing, he let out this howl to the rest of the baskers in the parking lot and said, hey, you guys, come on over here. And so everybody came. And while they were all gathered around, here's the ranger. There's Ken in his towel. There's the ranger with his notebook. And he looks up and he looks at all of the group. And he says, you know that this is the stuff legends are made of. And then went on. It was quite. It was quite a moment. So um, you know that was. You know, without all of those people, all those brave souls, actively uh, ex practicing experiential paddling um, and experiential learning, we never would have learned anything interesting, and we never would have had safety talks that lasted an hour. So here's my question to everybody that's sitting out there. Do you have any juicy stories to add to this? Because juicy stories are always welcome. Let's hear it from you guys. In other words, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, Penny. That was fabulous. Thank awesome, you, Penny. Penny. Thank awesome. you, Penny. <laughs> Penny, you're going to scare away the new members. <laughs> no. So let's let's hear the good stories from you guys. Uh, get, if, I get. May, if I may tell one from the Gonzo, one of the first couple years we did the Gonzo, we had one guy who came in very late, and it turns out. He just got tired and he lay down on Angel Island for a nap. And so the sun was going down, it was getting dark, and a group of us huddled in a circle at, um, at Horseshoe Cove. And, and, and uh, we started saying, well, he's a really good paddler and he's, he's just slow. And, and somebody said, I wonder if we should call the Coast Guard. And one of the voices in the circle said, yes, I think you should. And we looked up and in our circle was a guy wearing a green uniform and his lapel or his his shirt his uh, um uh, uh, uh label on his pocket said officer Payne," and it turned <laughs> out he was a coast guard officer and he came out to see what we were talking about and when he heard what it was he sent the boat out to go find the missing kayaker ah that's good mm -hmm. okay there have been more things than that i'm sure let's hear it No, well, I, I suppose for the benefit of the uh, younger, newer members, they should all hear about the uh, story of Grandpa getting run over by a freighter. Oh, indeed. Tell us the story. Okay. Um, a, a, a tradition that continues to this day for the last 15 <laughs> years is a Thursday night paddle every Thursday night year round. 52 Thursdays a year. Uh, they're still going on. Path, they're still path, always include John, um, John oh. Boshan, who's now 75-ish. Mm, and um, about six years ago, in early January, John and I were the only two people to show up for the Thursday night paddle. Uh, and so we paddled from the beach at... Um, San Quentin over to Red Rock and had a little campfire and a little potluck and a bottle of wine and got back in our boats by starlight and started doing a routine paddle back um, across the bay to San Quentin. And while we're paddling, we always chatted during this period about how hard it is to see freighters at night. Um, and as we're paddling, there along the, uh, close to the Bay Bridge, uh, Richmond Bridge, 
John points up at about a 45 degree angle and, and shouts, oh shit. <laughs> and there is the bow of a freighter 60 feet, over, looming 60 feet over our heads on a collision course uh, just seconds away. Um, and there's no lights on the front of these boats because all the lights are in the back. The, there was some reflected light from the bridge that allowed us to see them at all. So I paddled forward instinctively, even though I had to cut across the bow, I figured I had more momentum going that way. And I felt myself surfing down the wave on the far side of the freighter and going, whew, and you could see this white mustache of the white wave around the bulbous bow of the boat which you know, nicked the end of my boat as I went through. And I got to the other side and took a deep breath and looked over to John and say, wow, that was close. And he wasn't there. And so a 900 foot long boat takes about a minute and 15 seconds to pass by at 15 knots. And so a minute and 15 seconds later, I looked over and um, Oh, across the wake of the boat, and there's John's boat upside down without him in it, and John's head bobbing the water. As it turns out, John did not have a full wetsuit on. He had a Farmer John and a sweater and a, and a uh, windbreaker. Um, and he described the experience of getting of backing up, not backing up fast enough, getting sucked over the wave pummeled down 20 or so feet below the surface and swimming towards the surface after being sucked out of its boat. Um, and then his boat has been emptied of um, flotation because he filled it with firewood. So his boat was like a hollow sunken log and it was almost impossible to get the water out of. And he was hypothermic and couldn't uh, very well assist in his Get, getting back into his own boat after um, many um, failed efforts. So I called a cross guard on my radio, which came by and uh, they notified the ship traffic and a, um, a ferry boat came and picked him up. And then a few minutes later, the Coast Guard arrived and I said, you know, I just want to take his boat, you know, if you want to take his boat back to the uh, ferry terminal, I'll, pa I'll paddle myself home. And they said, no, sir, you're coming with us. I said, no, 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 I'm fine. Hey, I'll paddle back. And they said, no, sir, you know, I'll carry heavily gunned and everything. And I said, you are coming with us. So I got a nice ride in the um, Coast Guard boat back to the uh, ferry terminal. And we all lived happily ever after. Of course, I wondered what John's wife said to him when she got home. And this is like, oh yes, here you go again, you know, kind of thing, because uh, it was uh, not unusual, I guess, in John's life for that kind of thing. But we uh, all lived happily ever after. Next. So was that the incident, Tim, where uh, you guys came to a, a, some Basque event shortly after that to tell about it and told the whole story at the Basque meeting or wherever it was and the wives, the, the, the wives were there with you all and um, instead of offering sympathy to the two victims, uh, everybody huddled around the wives and hugged them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if that was you or if that was another one. That might have been another one. Uh, <laughs> Sandy, John's wife, is sort of used to this sort of thing. I'm coming back, oh. you know, with a, a dislocated shoulder or yeah. stitches in his head. Okay, so that would have been a different one. I was, yeah. I mm -hmm. just was remembering the two guys coming to tell about their hair raising adventure and then the wives getting all the sympathy. <laughs> May I jump in and say, thank you, Penny, and comment on experiential learning. I am so thankful that this groundwork has been laid over the years in Basque because the norm 
if any new members are still hanging in there or soon to be new members, is that we have a safety talk before every paddle. Most of the people on the paddle have had wilderness first aid classes. Um, there's discussion about conditions and currents and equipment and plan and backup plan, et cetera. Um, there's such a wonderful safety culture around Basque there's so much to learn about paddling on salt water on the bay and on the ocean. And so many people who've gone before and paved the way to know what the hazards are, what to look for, and uh, to talk to a new paddler. I rem remember my first paddle out the gate from Horseshoe Cove on a President's Day holiday. Um, I think we went all the way to Tennessee Beach or thereabouts, lunch on Rodeo Beach and, and back. And I just felt so cared for and nurtured. And um, yeah, it was a wonderful experience because there is this safety culture. And I thank you, Penny, and I thank you all who paved the way and continue. And we continue to have our experiences, but it's, it's all good. Uh, this is Margo. I'm not, as a rule, a terribly daring paddler because I'm not. But almost every time I get on the water, I'm thinking back to a paddle that Tom initiated that went around Angel Island and it had, it had a bunch of adventures. They were all pretty minor, but I remember every minute of it. And you get back to the beach and here are these people sort of languid drifting around. And it's like, what planet do you live on? I've been having adventures. Stuff has been happening. And even very tame paddles have that quality. Yeah, if I could jump in for just a second. I'm Bill Blakely. I'm not a very experienced paddler. But what I remember about the uh, the incident with the freighter was afterwards, um, both participants gave a very honest and thorough assessment of what happened and equipment failures and inattention to uh, worn out equipment. And I learned quite a lot from that. So, so it, I, my take on this is that uh, things happen, and you never know when, what what's what's happening, what's going to happen. But when you're paddling with a group of baskers, and, and usually there's a, a, a variety of people with very variety of experiences, and uh, whatever happens just takes care of the people take care of it. Uh, I can think of several incidents, but you know, we've, uh, I, don't, I don't know of any serious injuries that's ever happened. Well, I've heard of, well, uh, not lately anyway. So uh, I think it's a, it's a great club and group paddles are really important. I'll share and I'm sorry for being incognito here. Uh, guys, anyway, um, this is Lisa. Years ago, we used to have these spontaneous picnics on Angel Island. And, um, you know, this was back in the day when we still had a newsletter and we sort of planned far in advance for paddles. But, but um, I had a wild hair and I just wanted to go out and have a picnic on Angel Island. So I posted to the buzz and I said, no, I know this is short notice, but um, I'd like to do a picnic on Angel Island. And I didn't know how many people would show up, but it turned out to be about 30. And we launched and we launched out of Horseshoe Cove and we paddled around the south side of Angel Island. So we were going counterclockwise. So by the time we landed on China, China Cove, is it? You know, where they've got the memorial, the Japanese memorial. Mm -hmm. um, by the time we landed there, it was 30 kayakers appeared out of nowhere. And there were all these tourists milling around. They had taken the ferry over. And all of a sudden the beach was just overcome by all these kayakers. And then the food started coming out of hatches. Albert Wong was still alive. He brought a whole turkey. Um, somebody brought a rack of ribs and some, some charcoal. Somebody brought you know, uh, champagne. We filled two picnic tables, just mounded with food. And the tourists were looking at us with these expressions of just 
awe. And they were like, where did you people come from? And we pointed to the bridge and we said, that way. And they said, who are you? And, and I think Albert was the one who said, we're a kayak, we're an eating club with a kayaking disorder. And everybody laughed. It was just so much fun. That's it. And that reminds me, uh, this is Margo again, of the big ebb paddle that Lisa initiated from, uh, uh, is it, what is it called? Black, Black Point. Black Point um, to Horseshoe. And I, the expression on her face, she figured not many people would show up for this. Uh, the expression on her face was, what was it, 35-ish people? Some it of us was, pretty- it was, it was nearly 40 people. Oh God, and some of us were pretty darn inexperienced. And so what yes. you did was you said, the people who know how to sneak by Yellow Bluff go that way, the people who don't go the other way, now join up and get partners. And I partnered up with Tom and Ellen and uh, it, and we got it into Horseshoe. We missed Yellow Bluff completely because we were all so late relative to the schedule. Uh, we got into Horseshoe in the dark and it was cold. And that was just, it was one of those wonderful paddles. It's really fun to go with six knots or more. <laughs> I'm one of those strong. Does anyone guys. remember what year it was that we had the Queen of Vallejo crown or, or dubbed Don Fleming as Sir Don at the last Christmas party? Oh, I, I, I think that was like it. 90. That was 90 or 91 because it was one of my first or second parties. Ah, that was a good one. The Queen of Vallejo was was six two or six three, and we carried him in on our shoulders on a kayak on our shoulders. I remember it was the Lake Lake Merritt Yacht Club, which has a very low ceiling, so we had to walk kind of crouched a little bit to keep from bumping him into the ceiling. And then he he had a, a a sword wrapped in aluminum foil that he dubbed Don Fleming Sir Don, so he's our club royalty. You know, I've talked a little bit about the Queen of Vallejo. I think may maybe it's not so clear. What was that, Ken? Well, I wasn't there, but I, uh, the Queen of Vallejo, I think, has a very colorful history. We might talk a little bit about that. Tell us about the Queen of Vallejo, Jim. This was, this was before my time. I can only uh, do this second hand. I think someone who was there can do it better. <laughs> I've told the story. <laughs> the Queen of Vallejo's real name, stage name is Trauma Flintstone. He's a drag queen. And he was quite the queen that night. I don't think Don is here anymore tonight, is he? Guess not. Well, we should Don, have parties like that more often. Don used to joke uh, every time he landed on a beach, he would stick his paddle in the sand and say, I claim this land for the Queen of Vallejo. Mm -hmm. And then when he actually met this uh, stage performer, the Queen of Vallejo, I think Don stopped doing that. <laughs> <laughs> then there was the night that Mike Higgins was crowned the czar of the left coast. Mm-hmm. That was also at a Basque meeting. Yeah. And we so, so I'm, I'm reminded of something else that happened at a Basque meeting that was kind of fun. And in case I forget, I'll just break in and tell it right now. Um, after the shark bite incident uh, with uh, Ken Kelton and Mike Chin, uh, at the next Basque meeting, about 125 people showed up because they all wanted to hear all about it. And Ken came and he brought his boat and the boat was set up in the front of the lecture hall at UCSF. And we got one of the smaller members to sit in the boat and then two guys rocked it back and forth. And um, Barbara Cossey was the president at the time and she had a drum and she started tapping on the drum and said, Okay, now as the boat is going along, what I want you all to do is chant, shark, shark, go away. Kayakers are not your prey. <laughs> At which point, 
<laughs> all these people looked at each other and went, is she out of her mind? You know, like, I'm not going to do She was wearing a shark suit at the time. Well, so then what happened was she started beating the drum a little harder. The back door opened and in comes this shark. And the shark has got a huge head with teeth and it is going chomp, chomp, chomp. And the back of the shark was like a Chinese dragon. It was a long body that had, I don't know, four or five people in it. And the shark started making its way down the center aisle towards the kayak with Susan Cohen in it. And it was chomping like this. And by the time the shark got to the front of the room, 125 people were on their feet screaming shark, shark, go away. Kayakers are not your prey. It was one of the more memorable meetings that we ever had, actually. It was cool. That was cool. Great. Oh, Tom, you want to <coughs> say something? I'm going to tell about another, the origin of another tradition that's a little more recent. It happened in 2011. Um, at Mendocino, and many of you that have been to Mendo weekend in recent years um, know about the bourbon and brine, which is um, Nathan and Krista host this amazing cocktail party um, of Nathan's uh, creations at our, at our campsite. Um, and it started in 2011 when Nathan and Krista and Ellen were just finishing up their skills clinic. Um, and we all went to Mendo for the first time together. And it happened to be that that Nathan's 40th birthday fell on the weekend, on the Friday of Mendocino. And Krista organized this party for him secretly, a surprise party and a cocktail party. And they had this Prius with all these secret compartments underneath. And all week, Krista was secreting all of the, the cocktail glasses and the shakers and the bottles of liquor and and hiding them in all and, these compartments. And I think also a bunch of cupcakes. Yeah. Remember? And, and so she managed to stuff the, and I, I think they ended up having to pack a lot of their kayaking gear inside their kayaks because the car oh, was really? so full. And Nathan never suspected a thing. And we arrived at the campsite. And on that Friday, um, Krista, we really needed to set up the, the party. And so we had to get rid of Nathan. So we, we got some, recruited some baskers to, to uh, say, oh, we need some help with setting up our tent at our campsite. And so they took Nathan off and we got everything set up and we had the very first um, Mendocino uh, bourbon and brine. And during the party, um, some, someone brought a kayak full of cupcakes. Upside with, down with, jive. An upside down jive covered with, cu the, with cupcakes. The bottom of the kayak with was candles. covered with cupcakes with and that candles was, and they were all lit. Yes, that was the birthday. And, and then ever since then, uh, Nathan uh, kind of took up the challenge and has hosted this uh, bourbon and brine party every year at our, at our campsite. And it's been kind of fun. Those, those were Cabernet cupcakes. Oh, wow. Lisa, did you eat those cupcakes? Cabernet chocolate cupcakes. Uh, yummy. And uh, Nathan also invents new drinks for bourbon and brine, and they have names like the Gonzo. And uh, can anybody else remember the name of, of their favorite drink from bourbon and brine? Kayaker on the rocks. <laughs> that one. That one's named after a Point Bonita incident. Yes. <laughs> I, I just want to tell a quick short story about the bourbon and brine origination. Um, when we went out to pack the car for camping, I told Nathan to put all his gear up inside the kayak because the car was full because everything was hidden in my kayak bins underneath layers of gear. And when we pulled out of the driveway, it's, it's a Prius and our driveway is a little peaked at the end and the car just scraped on the driveway so bad. And Nathan looked at me and I said, it's dessert. <laughs> and he believed me. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. We uh, thank you, Penny. This was a great uh, uh, recollection and, and, and news for many of us new members, you know, uh, of, uh, of the history of this, uh, of this organization. Uh, that was really nice and uh, thank you all for 
participating in this memory. We now just need to continue and create another 35 years of, uh, of new memories too. Okay. <laughs> Good night then, thank you. Thank you everyone. Okay, see yeah. you next Thank see you. you next month. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks everyone. Nice to see you all. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks for sharing.